Hi, my name is Sharman Sita Fawala, and I am a research fellow at the New Age Skin Research Foundation. Today, I will be talking with Dr. Joshua Fox, who is the medical director and founder of Advanced Dermatology. He is also the president of the New Age Skin Research Foundation. Dr. Fox is a leading authority in the field of dermatology and is often cited in the media for his expertise. Today, I will be discussing the topic of melasma with Dr. Fox, and thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you so much for asking me, Sean. Uh, melasma is currently a condition affecting many individuals, especially women with darker skin tones. And I was wondering if you could maybe, in medical terms, explain what melasma is and what it looks like. I'm so glad that you're discussing this most important topic that affects millions of Americans. This condition, which is large, irregular brown patches that occurs both in the central facial area, the malar area, or the mandibular area, although it rarely even can occur on the arms or chest, but mostly on the facial areas, occurs with ma many different things can precipitate it. And, many, and there are many other uh, predisposing factors. For, for example, the age of the patient. You won't find melasma before someone hits puberty. The sex of the patient. Generally, over 90% of the cases occur in females. And the genetics, meaning that many patients who are darker skin types, we say Fitzpatrick's 4, 5, and 6, much like you were asking, Charmin, those are the ones who get it more commonly, although it does occur even in fair-skinned individuals. Thyroid disease is also a predisposing factor in that patients with thyroid disease have four times, up to four times the risk of developing melasma. Thank you so much for that description. Now, if these marks do appear, should one be worried? Is it cancerous or precancerous? These marks are completely benign. That means there is absolutely no danger. There's no danger of them turning into cancer or into another disease. However, with that being said, one must differentiate it from other things such as Cushing's syndrome, Addison's disease, and other forms of hyperpigmentation that can occur on the facial area. Therefore, one should seek the advice or guidance of a dermatologist who will easily be able to differentiate between these different conditions. However, for the millions of people that have this, it can be very debilitating and very embarrassing. Uh, you mentioned hyperpigmentation before. How can one differentiate between hyperpigmentation and melasma? Melasma, or some people call it cloasma, or the mask of pregnancy, often has irregular brown margins, while freckles are lentigines. The brown patches that occur also on the face, those are generally well circumscribed. And, and have a very well demarcated border. That's one way. Also, melasma generally occurs in the shape of a mask going across the cheeks and going across the forehead. As you see in these various pictures that we're showing you here, here you see one on the forehead, here you see another example on the cheeks and on the chin, although as I stated previously, can also occur rarely even off the face. Being a person with darker skin tone, do I need to be worried about developing melasma? Basically, what I'm trying to ask is what are the risk factors for developing this condition? Charmin, that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, there's no way at present to prevent getting the condition. However, there are several, many things you can do that once one has the condition to lessen the risk of getting it, such as staying out of the sun because the sun precipitates. Being less harsh with your skin when one, it, when one were to dry the skin or clean the skin, being uh, irritating your skin a lot may precipitate it once one already has the condition. Uh, birth control pills, whether estrogen or progesterone, more commonly estrogen, is known to precipitate it, as well as other phototoxic medication and other, other medications that interact with the sun are also known to precipitate it. Therefore, one should also use sunscreen and with both UVA and UVB block. However, UVA seems to be the more important wavelength. Therefore, when one gets a sunscreen, one should be sure that there's the UVA block, which are the longer wavelengths of the light, will 
pre help prevent or lessen the exacerbation of the melasma. Just one side point is that there's no harm in using makeup. Dr. Fox, is there any available treatment for melasma? There are treatments that are both over-the-counter as well as prescription. Hydroquinone, in up to 2% percentage, can be obtained over-the-counter. However, over 2% is a prescription, requires a prescription. Kojic acid, mequinol, soy, and azelaic acid, retinoic acid, these are all common topical treatments. In addition, there are things that we do within the dermatologist's office, such as microdermabrasion, chemical peels, and most recently, even laser has been shown to be helpful to treat melasma. Oh, wow. I didn't know lasers were available for melasma treatment. What kind of lasers uh, do you use, and about how many treatments does it take? So far, there's only one laser which has been approved by the FDA for use in treating melasma, and that is Fraxel. However, on several times, I have tried other lasers with moderate success. There are several different types of melasma, one which is just affects the epidermis and those which are dermal, means it goes deeper underneath the skin. As you see here in this diagram, here you see the outer layer of the skin, which is known as the epidermis, and underneath the epidermis you see the dermis. The deeper layer melasma is harder to treat, and the Fraxel has been more has been somewhat effective in treating it. Uh, unfortunately, it still does not treat it 100% of the time. In my experience, more like 60 to 70% of the time, it is effective. And it requires about three to five treatments. Dr. Fox, a really good friend of mine who is currently on birth control, uh, has had melasma for a few years now, and she's tried many of these topical treatments that you were discussing and now it's gotten so bad that she won't co come out with us. She doesn't really, you know, want to leave her apartment ever. Is there anything I can tell her and give her hope, or should she just stop worrying about treating it anymore? That's an excellent question. Many patients improve when they discontinue the birth control pills. However, many, for many patients, when they discontinue the birth control pills, the melasma may remain. So therefore, they need aggressive therapy. Aggressive therapy may just mean the right combination of mild therapies. So while I can't promise your friend that we can get her better, I can say that my success rate is clearly over 80 percent. So I think if, she's, if she will follow the therapies and she's compliant, then I think she has a very bright future for her and the millions of other Americans that have this condition. And finally, like I said before, people should realize that this is not the same therapies that we had 20 years ago. Many of these are new therapies, so they should have hope and they should go back to their dermatologists so that they can potentially achieve real help or cure for their melasma condition. And even if they're cured to remember that they must still stay out of the sun as it may reoccur. Dr. Fox, once again, thank you so much for this valuable information, and I enjoyed speaking with you. And thank you so much for you and all your hard work for the organization.